So that's the first case. Uh, type in your answers and uh, I'll wait for a few more seconds so that everybody gets a good time to have a look at the case. Okay. So we have a few more people coming in. So what we'll do is we'll give, for the first case, we'll give more time. Okay, so we have people in typing in tuberculosis, Crohn's, Cox junction, IC junction thickening, ileal TB, Okay, Rishabh, yeah, you rightly pointed out that there are surrounding lymph nodes. Is there anything particular about the lymph node? Okay, so as everybody rightly pointed out, there is IC junctional thickening, that is the ileocecal junction is thickened, and there are enlarged nodes. What's interesting is that this node, which is enlarged, shows a central necrotic area and the common uh, differential for that is tuberculosis. So if you see necrotic lymph nodes with ileocecal junction thickening, you're quite sure that this is tuberculosis. Crohn's is a differential, but uh, Crohn's would not typically have uh, necrotic nodes. That will present more with uh, transmural thickening and muco uh, mesenteric hyperemia, but necrotic nodes is very typical for tuberculosis. Does anybody know why uh, tuberculosis affects the ileocecal junction the most commonly? Okay, Peter's patches, okay, right, okay. Payers patches, yeah, Peters, I, I don't think they're called Payers, Peters patches, but I think they're Payers. Okay, yeah, Rishab corrected it. So because of the uh, uh, excessive, uh, the lymphoid uh, proliferation in this region uh, and stasis, ileocecal, uh, there are multiple reasons, but those are the most common uh, regions. Okay, so this was a case of tuberculosis, ileocecal junction and uh, a necrotic lymph node. Hope that is, uh, everybody got it. Moving on to the next case. So this is again a typical uh, spotter and we'll wait for some more time. Okay. 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 So yeah, everybody got it right. Uh, so this is a ranula, epidermoid as uh, someone mentioned is a differential, but this is a typical case of ranula. So uh, ranula is a cystic uh, dilatation, uh, a cystic structure that you commonly see at the floor of the mouth. It's a retention cyst commonly caused due to obstruction of one of the sublingual uh, glands. Uh, I would avoid calling it a plunging ranula because uh, I'm not. Uh, it should go behind the mylohyoid muscle, but here we don't see it going behind the mylohyoid muscle. So a cystic lesion at the floor of the mouth uh, is a ranula. Epidermoid is a differential, but this was a case of a ranula. Yeah, so Ronit rightly pointed out is also uh, a keyhole appearance. Okay, so the next case is a actual and coronal uh, skull CT in uh, bone window settings. Right. Okay. So everybody is getting it right. Okay. So this was a case of uh, left orbital roof fibrous dysplasia. Always try to mention full forms. I know this for this platform, it's okay because you're typing in your answers fast, but in your exams, always mention the complete diagnosis. 
um, full forms and the location. So just writing fibrous dysplasia may not get you the complete marks. Always mention that this is a left orbital roof fibrous dysplasia. Pagets is a differential, but uh, in pagent you'll get more cortical thickening. Uh, what is the treatment for uh, what is the treatment for fibrous dysplasias? Okay, I'm waiting for a few more answers, but uh, okay, some. Okay, somebody says radio frequency. Uh, does anybody want to attempt this? Perfect. So as uh, Rishabh uh, rightly pointed out, these are touch me not lesions. So these are benign lesions. And uh, the reason I uh, mentioned this because what happens is that if you do MRIs, for these lesions, they can have all kinds of weird appearances and uh, you may end up recommending a biopsy for these. So just be careful uh, if you see this typical ground glass appearance, uh, it's a fibrous dysplasia and uh, no further investigation is necessary. So what are the differentials for lucent or lytic bone lesions? Does anybody know what is uh, the mnemonic for that? Perfect. Okay, Sayan, you rightly pointed out uh, the mnemonic for that is phagnomashic. I'll, uh, yeah, perfect. I'll just uh, enumerate these, uh, I'll just expand that mnemonic. So F stands for fibrous dysplasia or fibrous cortical defect. E is for enchondroma or eosinophilic granuloma. G is for giant cell tumor or a geode, that's a subchondral cyst. N is for non-ossifying fibroma. O is osteoblastoma, M is METS or myeloma, A is aneurysmal bone cyst, S is a simple bone cyst, H is hyperparathyroidism or Brown's tumor, I is infection and infarction, C is chondroblastoma and chondromyxoid fibroma. Okay. Somebody asked me regarding how to differentiate it from ossifying fibroma. I'm not aware of it. Uh, I'll read up and I'll post, uh, if there is any specific imaging finding, I'll post it in our Telegram group. Uh, if you are aware, if anybody else is aware, you can type in that. Okay. Doctor, so Raj says size. Okay, I'm not sure. Uh, so we'll read up and upload, update. Okay, moving on to the next case. So this is an actual uh, CT, actual and coronal uh, head and neck CT in soft tissue window. We'll wait for a few more answers. Very good. It's good to see that you guys are typing the entire answers because that makes a difference. Okay, so what we see here is multiple small cystic lesion in both parotid glands. This is a typical appearance of lymphoepithelial cysts. What are two conditions associated with lymphoepithelial cysts? Perfect. So HIV is the most common condition, but this may also be seen in Jogren's syndrome. The pathophysiology is that because HIV is associated with lymphoid hyperplasia elsewhere, uh, they cause uh, metaplasia of the salivary glands, and then, which results in ductal obstruction and uh, these cysts. Okay, moving on to the next case, a coronal CT of the abdomen, post contrast.
Okay. Okay, CLD with Splenum megali. Okay. Pseudomyxoma. So I'm getting a partial right answers, but I've not got a complete answer yet. Okay, liver cirrhosis and portal hypertension. Okay, okay. Dr. Marwa, uh, I think, uh, yeah, that's the first, uh, you got it right. So what we see is a nodular contour of the liver. There is splenomegaly, there is ascites. So these three findings together constitute portal hypertension. So that's right. But additionally, what we see is that the ascending colon is thickened. So that is what is portal colopathy. What happens is that when there is liver cirrhosis, uh, the liver doesn't function optimally. So uh, the unprocessed metabolites, they reflux back from the portal vein. And uh, because of portal hypertension, there can be centrifugal flow. And the portal vein mainly drains the right half of the colon. That is why you may get thickening involving only the ascending colon because of these unprocessed metabolites causing inflammation in the colonic wall. So the complete diagnosis is cirrhosis with portal hypertension and portal colopathy. Additionally, there may be something known as portal biliopathy. What happens is that uh, if the portal vein gets uh, thrombosed, there will be portal cavernoma formation. And once these collaterals become dense, they can cause obstruction on the common bile duct which can cause obstruction and jaundice. So that is portal colopathy, uh, portal biliopathy. So along with cirrhosis, you can have portal colopathy and portal biliopathy. Okay, moving on to the next case. It's a straightforward case. So in this patient, what would you recommend next? And what would be the typical demographics of this patient? So again, I'm getting partial right answers. And I'm not saying, uh, I don't want to point out your mistakes. But even when you're reporting in, uh, say, your daily reporting, your impression should sum up everything what you see in the case. So if you get into the practice of complete diagnosis, it will really help you improve your impressions. I've seen people where they'll report like the body and the report, uh, body of the report and the impression is similar. Like you'll mention everything in the body and the same thing you'll mention uh, in the impression, which is not really ideal. Your impression should be crisp and short. So let's see if anybody gets it. Okay, so as everybody pointed out, what we have here is acute on chronic, bilateral, near symmetric, sacroiliitis. Okay, so Rishabh and Malik have uh, rightly pointed out, even Ayush has uh, mentioned, uh, so HLA-B27, commonly we see this in uh, uh, patients with ankylizing spondylitis. There are multiple other skeletal findings that we may see. So, and the typical demographics is that of a young male patient. What if I ask you, what if a patient has this kind of imaging picture and uh, he has associated uh, bowel thickening? What would that be? Perfect. Perfect. Enteropathic arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease associated arthritis. So, what's important is that whenever you see a uh, either of this finding always and always document the corresponding finding. So for example, if you see bilateral sacroiliitis, document that there is no bowel thickening. And if you see bowel thickening typical for Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, make sure that you look at the sacroiliac joints on CT and talk about them, even if they are normal, but make a specific comment about uh, the sacroiliac joints. Okay, somebody asked me why is it acute and chronic? Okay, I'll describe. Just for everyone's benefit, I'll go over the imaging sequences. So this image on the left is a stir sequence. A stir is uh, where fat is saturated and 
water or water containing tissue stands up this is a t1 weighted sequence the question was why is it acute and chronic so the reason why is it chronic because you see this sub articular fat sub articular uh, sub articular sclerosis that you see typically in chronic uh, sacroiliitis or chronic arthritis anywhere in the body so the body has enough time to undergo uh, for the joint to undergo subcondral sclerosis what we see here on the right side and maybe a little bit on the left side here is uh, bone marrow edema so on either side of the joint you see bone marrow edema that is suggestive of acute sacroiliitis so combining these two that is acute and chronic sacroiliitis hope that answers your question uh, dr suman so let's move on to the next case it's a simple straightforward case which we commonly see okay so this uh, okay a few people have got it right so what we see here is a homogeneously enhancing lesion uh, in the relation to the left clivus so this was a left antival meningioma a thrombosed aneurysm would be a differential but this is a post contrast sequence so uh, it would uh, appear more if it is thrombosed it will not pick up color and not pick up contrast and uh, in my experience uh, these uh, see although you see it very close to the left internal carotid artery the typical appearance of that of an aneurysm is uh, complex because there is blood in various stages you will see some blooming uh, you will see some uh, hypo intensities and will be a complex appearance so it's a differential but uh, uh, in this case this was a left and rival meningioma somebody said that this could be a trigeminal schwannoma uh, again that would be a bit more complex and i'm not sure if this would be the location for a trigeminal uh, nerve lesion it could be one of the branches of the trigeminal nerves the going through the cavernous sinus but the trigeminal nerve would be more posterior and maybe a, a, a lower uh, section so yeah both images are post contrast images okay uh, what is the uh, typical what are the typical signs described for a meningioma although we don't see it here right so ayush ayush uh, ronit all of you have rightly pointed out uh, so it's the dural tain sign so you'll see a thin uh, layer of thick and dural adjacent to it uh, it's probably reactive uh, dural thickening uh, adjacent to the meningioma a historical sign which we don't see but if we do a perfusion imaging uh, say to distinguish it from a malignancy rarely uh, meningiomas can appear aggressive and in that cases we may need to do a uh, perfusion although it's not practice uh, now but what is a historical sign that is commonly seen uh, on angiography yeah it's an interesting sign i don't know if it's relevant uh, from a diagnostic perspective it's just uh, uh, interesting one of those signs where radiologists have been uh, super creative yeah perfect so it's the mother in law sign so the reason why uh, it's that call uh, and uh, so because what happens is that contrast comes in early and stays for a longer time so that uh, uh, some frustrated radiologist has equated that to a mother in law who would come early and stay at his home for a long period of time yeah so comes early and leaves late <laughs> i would not go into the details of that but uh, yeah that's just an interesting uh, caveat uh, but that does help on uh, perfusion because rarely we may do perfusion and that's the imaging appearance that you have to be aware of so moving on to the next case okay so most of you have got it right so this is a colloid cyst of the third ventricle 
most commonly these are located at uh, the foramen of Monroe. The typical appear imaging appearance is that of a hyperdense uh, cyst which is unilocular and which is located at the foramen of Monroe. In 50 percent of the cases these can be T1 hyperintense as well. Usually it is an incidental benign finding but uh, what is one complication that you have to report whenever you see your collide cyst you do not stop there. You have to say that there is no dash. Right. So, we have to mention if there is any hydrocephalus. So, it can cause uh, hydrocephalus and uh, usually these patients will present with acute onset of headache. But mostly what we commonly see these are incidental findings. A differential that uh, Dr. Suman rightly mentioned is SEGA, that is a subependymal giant, giant cell astrocytoma. Commonly, we see that in tuberous sclerosis patient. There will be additional findings, uh, but st long term stability uh, would be against that of SEGA, but that is also a common location for SEGA. Uh, another important thing that you have to remember is that on flare images, you will not be able to appreciate these lesions. So, make sure that you go through your T1 weighted sequences really carefully. What happens is that T1 we tend to ignore uh, in a lot of uh, body systems, but T, but trust me, if you have to, uh, if you can ask for one sequence uh, for any pathology, that is T1. Not only do you see the anatomy really well, but you will be able to make out that there is some pathology. You may not be able to distinguish what is it and what is causing it, but T1 is excellent in delineating pathology. So, make sure that uh, you look at your T1 sequences carefully. So, Ramit, uh, we should mention that there is no hydrocephalus. If you see a colloid cyst, uh, you should mention that there is, uh, okay. So, what is this appearance and uh, what is the sign and uh, what is the diagnosis? Okay, perfect. So, everybody rightly pointed out. So, this is a celery stalk appearance of uh, mucoid ACL degeneration. So, this is a sagittal water sensitive sequence, what we see here is that the ACL is thickened and hyper intense. So, that is uh, that resembles a celery. Uh, so, we can just google what celery looks like, so that you remember what the mistake what we do is that whenever we read about signs, we do not look at their normal appearance. Like for example, if you see a read say celery stock sign quickly google how does a celery look. So, that is the reason for calling signs and we have forgotten that, that because these things resemble common uh, structures, although because of the geography, like for example, something that may be common in North America is not common in India or say Middle East, but uh, these are aids for remembering these things. So, always whenever you see any sign, make sure you just google what it is. So, for example, if you see celery stock sign, then just google what is celery. If you see bear paw sign, so you just go google what does a bear paw look like. And then that will help you to remember the pathology and that is the purpose of these signs and not just to mug up. Okay, moving on to the last case for uh, today, tonight, depending on whenever you are seeing this uh, presentation. Okay. Very good. So, this is an actual, uh, uh, say an actual ultrasound at the level of the thyroid. So, you see the thyroid, you see the larynx and this is the sagittal section at the same level. So, what we see here is an anechoic lesion with a eccentric echogenicity. So, 
Okay, so this, so as everybody rightly pointed out, this is myocysticercosis and mus intramuscular uh, cysticercosis. There is mild associated uh, uh, soft tissue reaction around the cyst. So always uh, uh, don't stop there. Look what is the cyst is causing around it. So these cyst usually themselves are uh, uh, benign, like they'll not cause any issues, but once the cyst structures either it ruptures or uh, there is some inflammation around it that is when the patient will present the interesting thing i don't know why but these are commonly seen in superficial muscles so say strap muscles temporalis uh, abdominal wall muscles back muscles which is a good thing for us because uh, the patient will present uh, with a swelling and uh, you'll be able to see these on ultrasound really well So this was a case of uh, cysticercosis. Uh, what's uh, important point to remember is that we are in the habit of calling NCC everywhere and I've seen that people committing that mistake again and again, again and again. So this is not newly cysticercosis. It can't be NCC. Cysticercosis is a good enough diagnosis. If you want to go one step further, you can say myocysticercosis or intramuscular cysticercosis. So yeah, so silently rightly, so you see on radiographs, what we see is uh, typically rice grain classifications. Uh, the other interesting thing is that uh, these patients usually have uh, extensive uh, multisystemic disease. So uh, if the patient also has CNSC symptoms, always recommend a CT. In fact, a very interesting investigation in this case is what is known as whole body MRI. So what we can do is uh, scan multiple sections of the body and stitch them together, say a fluid sensitive sequence, and you will see something known as a starry sky appearance. So cysts which are throughout the body, intramuscular, subcutaneous, they light up. And if you just Google, uh, in fact, we have written it up uh, a case report ourselves. So disseminated cysticercosis can give rise to this uh, starry sky appearance. In uh, for a muri cysticercosis, there is a classification which even I was not aware of, to be honest. So, does anybody know what is the CNS classification for muri for cysticercosis? What's the classification called for the various stages of cysticercosis in the brain? Right. Okay, so as Ayush and Sayan and Dr. Ala have rightly pointed out, uh, these are the different stages, but the classification is known as Escobar uh, classification. So you can just Google it and uh, read about it. It's not very common, but you may uh, uh, be asked about it in the exams. So make sure that uh, you read about it. Uh, somebody asked me about uh, the previous case, how uh, mucoid degeneration, how will you differentiate it from a partial tear? It would be difficult, but uh, one interesting thing I have learned from my MSK mentors is that partial tear is a, like a term which you should avoid in most cases. So either the ACL is torn or it is not torn. Partial tear, high grade sprain, sprain, all these terms mean nothing to the orthopedicians. They are looking for is there a tear or is there no tear. Additionally, you will see what are known as ancillary findings in cases of ACL. So we will try to cover them uh, in one of our upcoming lectures. So do read about what are ancillary findings which you may see in an ACL tear. That will help you say when you are hedge, you are not sure what is happening. Is it a tear? Is it not a tear? These ancillary findings can help you diagnose that. So just to revise uh, whatever we discussed. We discussed a case of tuberculosis, IC junctional thickening with the necrotic nodes. We discussed a sub sublingual cystic lesion that's a ranula. We discussed a fibrous dysplasia. We discussed differentials of lytic lesions. The mnemonic for that is phagnomasage. We discussed bilateral lymphoepithelial cysts, commonly seen in HIV and joggerins. Cirrhosis of the liver with portal hypertension. We also learned about what is portal colopathy and portal biliopathy. We discussed acute or chronic sacroiliitis in a case of ankylosing spondylitis. 
meningioma and the associated signs, a colloid cyst and how it can present mucoid degeneration of ACL and uh, what is the associated sign. And lastly, we discussed intramuscular cysticercosis. Thank you guys for uh, uh, joining me today. And uh, if you like this video, please make sure you like it. That will help us uh, reach to more people and that helps with the YouTube algorithm. And uh, I guess the discussion went smooth and uh, we can continue this or we can shift back to Zoom. If you want to be notified about the future lectures, what you can do is you can, uh, sub you can join our YouTube channel, you can join our Telegram channel. I have uh, I've, uh, put in a link in the description or you can just search uh, on Telegram and you'll find us or you can join our WhatsApp channel. So whatever is convenient to you. Uh, glad that uh, you guys uh, uh, learned a few uh, things today. So thank you and uh, good night, good evening depending on what part of the world you're